By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And welcome back at the Camel Trophy here in Arnhem, the Netherlands. This is a gentleman's old school magic tournament. We've reached round number four and I'm really excited about this round because we have a beautiful mono blue deck that's coming in action. I've called it Mono Blue Sage because Sage of Latinam plays a pretty big role in this deck. It's piloted by Rob and he is taking on Peter. We've seen Peter before in this tournament in action. He's playing a Fajern Enchantress deck and his deck is doing really, really well. He can make it into the top eight just as Rob can still uh, do. We play five rounds in total. This is round number four. So I'm just really excited to see these decks going face to face. Now, before I start with the deck decks, I've got deck photos of both of these decks. I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to first go to the match, watch the deck tech later or skip them all together. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG games, click on there and it'll take you straight to the action. And as for now, we are going to continue with the deck decks. I'm gonna start with the deck of Rob. Let's take a look at his mono blue list. And here we see the mono blue deck of Rob. And I really like this list because he's made some interesting choices. Usually with mono blue, you go the aggro route with like your Lord of Atlantis or Unstable Mutation, you know, your, your psionic blast and you just wanna get it over with really, really quickly, win that tempo game, deal a lot of damage. Or you go more to the control route uh, where you play more a counter magic uh, game. Now, when we're looking at this list, it's kind of in the middle of those two strategies, isn't it? it it's quite heavy on artifacts. And I think that Sage of Latinam is a nice card to begin because it really illustrates, I think, the more strategic um, level of this deck. So Sage of Latinam is a one, two creature for one blue and one. You can tap it to sack an artifact and then you get to draw a card. Now, this may not sound like much, but it's actually quite powerful. It works so well with mana vaults. It also works nice with the Suchis because you can sack them wherever to get the four extra mana from the Suchi. And of course you get to draw a card. For example, if you then have a Brain Geyser in hand, that can be a great combination. It also works great with those two trikes there at the top, you know, a trike six to cast. Once you have those counters, the, the counters on the trike are used up. It's just a 1-1 one, one, and then you can still sack it to the Sage and get a card for it. So that's great value. That's basically what the Sage does, isn't it? It gives you great value for all your artifacts cards. Worst case scenario, you get a card out of your artifact. You know, that's pretty good. I mean, look at the Mox and he's got in the deck. Sometimes you draw a Mox late game or mid game when you already have enough mana. You're like, what to do with the Mox when you've got a Sage on the battlefield? It's worth a card, right? You can basically cycle it, which is quite nice. So that Sage really kind of gives a deeper level to the deck. And then when we look at the rest of the creature base, we see it's really built up well. We've got at the one drop, we've got the flying man, the two drops, we've got the sages, the three drops, of course, we have the Saranda Befreet, an absolute powerhouse, one blue and two to cast for a three, four flyer, probably the best flyer in old school. Then for four, we've got Suchis, we've got Juggernauts, and we've got a personal favorite of mine, you don't see it often, Phantasmal Forces, a beautiful card, one blue and three, and you do get, for that mana, you get four power in the air, which is pretty good. Of course, the card does have some downsides. You gotta pay one blue during your upkeep or it's destroyed and it only has one toughness, so you can ping it and it dies. Now, when we're looking at the rest of the deck, we of course see the Time Walks, Ancestral Recall, the Brain Geyser. I'm a little bit surprised that I only see one copy artifact in this list. I think you could play with more copy artifacts. I'm really happy to see the Old Man of the Sea, but I can imagine if I would build it, probably the old man would go out of the deck or to the sideboard and I would put in an extra copy, but that's just my opinion. Um, but I really love this deck. I know that uh, Rope has done very well with this deck in the past. He even won a tournament with this list. I'm not sure if it's exactly the same uh, list. Rob, maybe you can let me know in the comments, but you've won a tournament with a mono blue list with Sages and Phantasmal Forces in it because I was there and that was very spectacular. Anyway, this is the list of Rob. Now let's take a look, look at the list of his opponent, Peter. And here we see the deck of Peter. So this is for Jern Enchantress, right? Combined with mainly blue, we also see a little bit of red. And even in the sideboard, we see some white. So that's quite interesting. Let's first kind of focus on what he wants to do here. So for Jern Enchantress, two green and one to cast for an O2. Beautiful creature, beautiful art. Uh, but it also has a useful ability because when you cast an enchantment, you get to draw a card, which is quite nice. So if you play, for example, your Sylvan Library, you get to draw a card. Talking about Sylvan Library, it's a card that goes together quite well with Fajorian Enchantress because it allows you to look at the top three cards, put them in order. So that means that you're gonna put an enchantment on top, 
draw the enchantment, play the enchantment, draw another card, and the more cards you draw, of course, the better the Sylvan gets, because then next turn, you probably get to see three completely new cards. Again, you're gonna put those enchantments at the top and kind of create your own drawing engine. Now, this card uh, goes together quite well with another enchantment here, Dark Heart of the Wood. Dark Heart of the Wood, one green and one black, a card from the dark. If you sacrifice a forest, you gain three life. Now, this is really a control deck, right? You wanna get your card draw engine going, you know, you want to draw into your burn spells, you want to start copying your Fudurian Enchantress, you want to do all these shenanigans, that means you need time. Life gain equals time, right? So if Peter can find his Dark Heart of the Wood quite early in the game in combination with an Enchantress, he can start sacking forests, drawing cards, gain some life, you know, and I think then he's in a good position. If he cannot, you know, then it's going to get difficult for him. What I also like in this deck is that he is playing Channel Fireball, but what he can also do is he can use his channel to just gain a lot of, just hurt himself basically, lose a lot of life. Why would you want to do that? Because he's also playing Mirror Universe. So let's say he's in a situation where he's got a Brain Geyser and a channel. He could kind of draw a lot of cards, hurt himself a lot, and then next turn use his Mirror Universe and change life totals. Like that would be an ideal scenario for him. That would be really funny if you could pull that off. Um, and then in the sideboard, which is quite interesting, he is playing with some white card so he's playing circle of protection red which of course is a problem for him like this deck if it has to deal with an earthquake that's going to be disastrous and of course an aggressive red deck like a lot of burn that's going to be quite hard for Peter to uh, to handle with he really wants to go that control route so I get it that he put a circle of protection red there and also a circle of protection black against uh, I guess against the uh, the aggro black decks as well and because you've got access to city of brass and you've got access to four birds of paradise there could be a scenario where you're able to kind of, you know, get white mana and play these cards because they only have white, one white in their casting cost anyway. So, you know, overall, I think Peter's deck is um, it's really funny. It's looking good. It's looking okay. And uh, I, I, I always look forward to see Enchantress because you don't see it that often. And now that we've seen Peter's deck, we've talked about Rob's deck, it means we are ready. Let's go to the round four match. Rob versus Peter, Mono Blue versus Verjurn Enchantress. Game number one, here we go. We've got Peter on the play, sitting on the right. He's playing his Verjurn Enchantress deck, opening here with a Birds of Paradise, passing the turn to Rob. He's playing a Mono Blue deck with a lot of artifacts and Sages of Latinam. He's starting with a Mishra's Factory and a Pass. So now three mana for Peter. Can he cast an Enchantress? Tapping two, there's a Dark Heart of the Wood. So it's an enchantment from the dark. He can sacrifice a force to gain three life. There's an island by Rob. Is he able to play a Sage? There's a Black Lotus. Could sack the Lotus here. He's got a lot of four drops in the deck, four Juggernauts, four Suchis. I mean, this Black Lotus gives him a lot of options. The question is, does he want to use it? A little bit in the tank here, trying to decide if he wants to use the Black Lotus, yes or no. Another option could be here to animate the factory, attack with the factory. Probably deal two points of damage. He is second the Black Lotus here. Tapping the factory. And there is a Suchi, 4-4 Suchi on the battlefield. There is a City of Brass. There is a Channel. Channel Fireball, oh man. He's winning it here. Channel Fireball. What is this? What's going on? Man, this is ridiculous. This game was, what, 10 seconds? Oh, my God. But, Peter, congratulations. When you've got the components, you've got the Channel Fireball combo, you can take the game. Anyway, both players are going to shuffle up, dive into the sideboards, and we'll catch back up with them in game number two. Game number two. Here we go. So it's now Rob on the play after that insane game one. And uh, Rob having a good opener here with the Soul Ring, passing the turn to Peter, starting with a Tropical Island and a pass. If he can find a land, are we going to see a 4-drop? He's got 4 Suchis, 4 Juggernauts. Would be great for him to play any of those two out right now, put full pressure on uh, Rob here. I mean on Peter. I think that's what Rob needs to do. Just, uh, you know, play those creatures, put the pressure on. Tapping 4 mana. There is the Juggernaut. 5-3 has to attack. In response, there's the Ancestral Recall by Peter. And then now he's taking his turn. I believe he's forgetting to draw, though. I believe he still has to draw. Exactly, still has to draw a card. Anyway, played out a uh, City of Brass. And look at that. He's copying the Juggernaut. 
And the Juggernaut, remember, it has to attack. So this is basically a trade here. That's a good move by Peter. He's got five mana. There's a discard, by the way, from uh, Peter still. So Rob's got five mana. Ooh, Sayane Blast. That is pretty good. He goes full aggro. Now he can uh, animate his factory, actually. He can deal seven points, choosing not to, though. He's playing a uh, mana vault instead and tapping a blue for a flying man. So full pressure here. It's full on by Rob. That's his strategy. Wants to deal a lot of pain. I think that's a pretty good strategy. We also see a maze of F here being played. Ooh, and a copy artifact. And we can see here that uh, Peter is really finding the answers here to stay alive. Okay. Two cards in hand only for Rob. What is he going to do? He has to attack with the Juggernaut. He's probably also going to attack with the Flying Man. Why not? And then I wonder if... Peter is going to trade Juggernaut for Juggernaut. It does seem a sensible trade to make. Tapping the Mana Vault for three. Does he maybe have a Triskelion? Could play a trike to take out the Juggernaut on the side of Peter. Tapping even more. Does he have a Brain Geyser perhaps? Time Walk. Interesting. Still has lots of mana in the pool though. And a Phantasmal Forces. This is quite interesting. So he's going to attack. There's the trade. And he's probably just going to take one. So one of the lines of play that Rob could have done was first attack and then make this play. And there we see the untap of the Mana Vault. Because now uh, Peter has that information. He doesn't want to use the Mace to send back the Flying Man. Because he knows that the time walk turn is coming. So he's dropping to 12 here. Exactly. I think he forgot the damage earlier. So it's going to go to 11. There's an island. So, I mean, a little bit of a sloppy play by, 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 by Rob, I feel. Because he could have done four points of damage here. But anyway, it's now Peter's turn finding a bayou. Still a lot of pressure on the board from Rob, but that Mace of If is a little bit annoying for him. There's a Birds of Paradise by Peter. And there's a pass turn. Untapping, paying the one blue for the Phantasmal Forces. He could just animate attack with everything. That's exactly what he does. Sending back the Forces, taking three. Gonna drop to eight. It's looking pretty good for for Rob. His only problem is cards. It would be great for him to draw into the Sage of Latinam or Brain Geyser. That would be even better. Tapping four here by Peter. Oh, there's a fireball taking out two creatures with one fireball. This is really good for him. And that's of course the downside of the Phantasmal Forces. It only has one toughness. So it's very easy to kill. And this is a problem now for Rob. Because that Maze of If is still in the game. And he's just passing the turn. So this is great here. Ooh, there's a Control Magic. Cannot use it yet. There's a Vajuran Enchantress. Passing the turn back to Rob. And Rob finding another Mishra's Factory. So next turn potentially he could attack with his two factories. Let's see what Peter can do finding another land. Can he play an enchantment here? There's a Sylvan Library. That is great for him. Drawing a card because of the enchantress, of course. Two more. There's a Dark Heart of the Woods. Oh, man. This is looking really good for Peter now. Things are going south here for Rob. The Dark Heart of the Wood is a problem. Remember, he can sack force to gain life. And that's the only thing that Rob has the advantage over is the fact that Peter's quite low on life. I mean, Peter's got more cards and more things on the board. It's looking quite bad for Rob here. Two cards in hand. A Brain Geyser could really help him here. 
Animating both factories. Playing an island. Going in with 2-2-2, two, 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 sending one back. Then he can pump it the other with it. He's not doing it though. Because he's going to use it for something else it seems. What is he going to do? There's a trike. This is pretty good. He can use the trike to kill the enchantress. Maybe he doesn't want to because, I mean, look at Bather's life total. But I think with the Dark Heart of the Wood, what I would do in his position is kill the Enchantress here. Yeah, I think this is a good decision. That Enchantress is kind of the core of the deck, right? It's his card drawing engine. And Bather here not looking at the top three cards. Because he still has the Sylvan, right? Oh, look at this, the control magic. But that's not too bad because he can kill his own trike. So basically, it's a very expensive way to get rid of a 2-2. So that's not too bad if you're Rob. Drawing a card here for turn. Animate again and he can attack. Changing his mind though, saying, wait a minute, I want to do something else before. Playing a copy artifact on a factory. That's quite nice because he can already pump them up. So now we make it into a 4-4. Look at that. He's on one. One measly life. But remember, he still has the Dark Heart of the Wood. He's got two forests, the Bayou and the Tropical Island. He can sack those. And of course, now he is using the Sylvan. And here we can see the strength of the Dark Heart of the Wood. It makes it so hard to kill somebody when that card's on the, on the battlefield. And there, I believe, is a Wheel of Fortune. Super risky here. But Peter kind of has to. He's in a corner on that one life. He's got three forests, right? So that equals nine more life. Plays a maze, but he already played a land for turn. Played the Tropical Island. Playing out two Moxen as well. Yeah, and this is really something that... That's really my advice for players. Keep an eye on that because it's, it's it happens to me as well. I play a draw seven or a draw seven effect happens and I forget that I already played out of land. But it is kind of crucial because now he's got that double, you know, maze block. There's the attack. Blocking one with the birds. And two are being sent back. Now he's going to tap some more. Are we going to see some more fuel here? On the board of Rob. Remember, he's playing with a lot of creatures. I'm expecting some Suchi, some, okay, Juggernauts. Wow, look at that. Surrender a Freed and a Juggernaut. In combination with the three factories that are already there, it's a lot of creature pressure. We do see a Control Magic here. And that Control Magic is pretty important. He's passing the turn, so I guess that's not a Control Magic then in hand. Maybe I was mistaken. I thought that blue card was a control magic, but if it would have been, he would have used it. Attacking here, sending two creatures back. Now he's got to sack a lot of force, three or two force in total, gain, lose six, gain six. So he's still on one. There we see a Suchi, more pressure on the board. Okay, it's a power sink. And now he's playing the power sink. I mean, he's got the, he's got to tap the blue. Can he counter the power sink? Countering the power sink. That is a really important counter spell here by Rob. Three cards. I believe I saw a time walk there. So he could choose to time walk to literally buy him some time because that's all it really does. What I don't understand here is that he doesn't play his land. Plays his land for turn. And I guess that's it. Okay, they're not finishing it. Peter saying, you know what? I saw my cards, you got this game. That means it's 1-1 one, one, and I'm excited about that because it means we are going to go in game number three. Game number three, here we go. Peter on the play after losing game two and uh, round number four here at the Camel Trophy in Arnhem, the Netherlands. Look at this opener by both players. There's a Sage turn one. Haven't seen a Sage yet. So Rob is finally finding his Sages. And Peter has found a fast bond. There is a control magic though on the Sage. That is really good. Also because Peter has two Moxen for himself. 
And remember, Rob is playing a mono blue list, so there's not a lot he can do against the control magic, actually. Playing a Juggernaut here. Ooh, is that an Ancestral Recall? Yes, Ancestral Recall here for Peter. That is a great draw. Also finding a Soul Ring there. And that Soul Ring also equals a card. If he chooses to, because of that Sage. Let's see if he can find some defense against the Juggernaut. There's a Disenchant. That's your answer. Does take a damage. Gonna drop to 19. Attacking here with the Sage, it seems. And there's a Soul Ring. So both players on 19. Quite a lot has happened. There's another Island. Tap of four. <laughs> There's the control magic. I love it. You got the sage. No, I got the sage. You got the sage. And I mean, the sage is really an important comp uh, component of the uh, of the deck of Rob here. Component, I should say. Anyway, there's a Birds of Paradise and a Wheel of Fortune. I'm loving this game three, guys. I'm loving it. There we see the discard. So Rob there is losing a control magic, which is quite good in this matchup. So both players drawing into seven new cards and it's still Peter here on the play. Let's see what he can do. There's another control magic. He could steal the Sage again. That'll be funny. How important is the Sage? What other options does he have in hand? Tapping two, three here. Playing it for Journey Enchantress. That makes sense. Still has the Birds of Paradise and the Mox Sapphire for mana. I believe I do see a Sylvan there. Passing the turn though. I thought I saw a Sylvan there, so he could have, I believe, tapped Birds of Paradise and the Mox to cast it, but perhaps it's not a Sylvan in hand. It's hard to see. Or maybe he chose otherwise, wants to keep his options open. Maybe he's got some counter magic in hand. We'll just kind of wait and see. There's a Black Lotus. Mox Chat is being tapped. So he's got one black mana floating. Really wonder what he's gonna do. He's got a full grip of cards, of course, after that Wheel of Fortune. The other Mox gets tapped too. So one blue, one black, four mana now in total. There's a Juggernaut hitting the board. Tapping two blue. There's a Time Walk. No response here. By Peter. Second the jet to draw a card. Now he's gonna untap, taking his extra turn. So he's in his first main. Tapping the sapphire, there's a mana vault. Tapping the vault for three. Tapping three more for six. Are we going to see a trike? There's a trike. Triskelion 4-4. Four, four, killing two of the creatures. This is a really good move. Things are looking really good here for Rob. Attacking here for five. Going to put him on 13. Pater's dropping to 13 and he's in serious trouble. Really needs to find some answers. If he's got a control magic, I would definitely use it. The question is on what are you going to use it? I mean, remember, if he steals, for example, the Juggernaut, in response, Rob could use the Sage, sack the Juggernaut. If he steals the Sage, he only has a 1-2 creature. If he steals the Trike, it's only a 1-1. One, one. Oh, this is a good card to play here. Clone, cloning the Triskelion. That is nice. This is a good play. Now, in response, Rob can, of course, use the Sage to draw a card and then I believe Peter needs to choose another target there's a mana drain though mana draining away the clone so four more mana next turn now there's the control magic and now the response is here sacking it and he also gets a card so this is I mean this is this is why Sage is so great right because he's basically countering the control magic and he's getting a card as well. And yes, he's losing a creature, but I mean, it could have been much, much worse. And that card draw is just phenomenal. Gonna sack here the Mana Vault now. Draw even more cards. 
So that Sage is really doing its job here for uh, for Rob. Now he only has that one one. Could put Peter on 12, of course, that's something. Really wonder what else he's got in store for us. There's the attack for one, Peter on 12. Tapping two more. There's a Chaos Orb. Not really a target at the moment, in my opinion. Passing the turn back here to Peter. And he's got a City of Brass. What else does he have in that hand? Ooh, this is really good. A Brain Geyser. I mean, this could change the game. This could get Peter right back into it. And there's no counterspell, it seems, by Rob. So this is super important. Playing it here for eight. Wow. There's a Channel Fireball again, but he's very low on life at the moment. Playing out a Maze of If. Yeah. Passing the turn, it seems. And there's a quick strip mine on the maze, by the way. Also discarding an island. So the fireball is kind of nice. But, yeah, ideally you really want to have your enchanters and some enchantments to kind of get your, your card drawing engine going. But he's got a full grip of cards again. I wonder what Rob's going to do. I wouldn't be surprised if he attacks for one, put him on 11, and then, you know, sacks the Triskelly into the Sage to draw an extra card. There's the attack. Of course, he also has... Okay, he's going to sack the Mox. That's what I wanted to say. He also has that Mox. So one blue floating and drawing a card, of course, off of the Sage because he sacked the Sapphire. What else can he do here? Tapping three blue. Surrender a freed, perhaps? <laughs> Suchi, of course, he still had the one blue floating, so playing a Suchi. So there's some firepower here. Another Sage. Passing the turn. And now let's see what Peter can do after that Brain Geyser, right? Now he untaps. He's got all his options again. And do remember, this is round number four. We're, we're playing five rounds in the Swiss. I believe both of these decks can still make it into top eight. So a victory could really help them on their way. Fucking bastard. Oh, actually, no, 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 I will. Peter playing a tropical yeah. island. There's a channel and a fireball. Now he's got he's to do some calculating. Because he's on 11, remember, so channel, you can pay one life for a mana. You get a mana in return. The question is, is that a good thing? I'm sure he wants to find a way to kill everything on the side of Rob. So first of all, he needs to use, I believe, the City of Brass for red mana, right? So that'll put him on 10. No, he's taking it back. Playing the channel. Playing a Dark Heart of the Wood. Okay, so this is feasible. The Dark Heart does change a lot. So he's going to go to 10, playing the Fireball. Wow, this Dark Heart changes a lot. Can he sack enough? Don't think he can, though. Ah, yes, of course. So he can sack the lands, go up to 19. And then he's got enough lands to, I think, win the game. Do we have a counterspell from Rob? No, we don't. Oh, man. Man, oh, man, oh, man. So that is very, very interesting. Again, Peter wins with Channel Fireball. So he's won game one with Channel Fireball. Game two, or sorry, game three with Channel Fireball. It is insane. And in this entire tournament, Peter keeps finding that Channel Fireball and winning games with it. It's, it's insane. I mean... 
I knew it was a good combo, but looking at it in this deck of Pater, it, it's it's like this almost sure bet. It's it's insane. So it's looking quite good for Pater. Maybe we'll see him later in this tournament as well, because uh, I believe he's gonna make it into top eight, and I think Rob still has a little little chance of making it into the top eight as well. And talking about that all, next week we have more action from the Camel to uh, Trophy round number five, the final round of the Swiss, and then we're gonna dive into the top eight. Now, if you wanna follow all that right here on Timmy Talks, make sure you subscribe and ring that bell. And if you're already a sub, thank you very much for uh, for being a subscriber and supporting the channel that way. Before you go, I'd like to ask you to like, share, and comment on this video. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. And we also have our very own Patreon page, so you can become a patron of the channel. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks to find out how you can support Timmy Talks. It already starts with just $1 and for that $1 you get access to the Discord and your name will be mentioned at the end of every single video, including this one. So let's go to the end scroll.